So first of all, I have to apologize because during the week when the midterm uh, week was off, I gave you a lot of time to present your papers. So we got a week behind. So um, the Hinduism was supposed to be three days or even four days. And then the Buddhism was supposed to be three days. Each of those would have been three days. And we've got to condense it into two. So I apologize. You do not have to read everything. Um, but I will, next time, the absolutely necessary reading is the reading about women. And that's not a long reading. And then half of the reading about Gandhi. I would like you to do for sure for next time. Okay, now I'm gonna go over some themes here. And I think at the end of the class, I will get you into groups. So please have three points that you want to talk about in your group. Even if you came completely unprepared, just listening to me talk, I want you to engage in the groups. I really don't want to come into a group and nobody's talking. There's no reason for that. Um, you're in college. You can get ideas. You can, you know, you can think on your feet. Um, all right. And in addition, I'm going to stop every once in a while and the first three students to raise their hands, I'll call on. Although I hope it isn't the same three, right? And so if there's more than three and one of them's already talked, I don't want the same three students to dominate, but everybody's gotta raise their hand eventually. So when it's something you care about, raise your hand, because I wanna make sure I call on everyone before I put you into groups, all right? All right, so the first topic I want to cover is, um, is the, the notion of creation, okay? I think this is fascinating and we will actually examine what does the word creation mean? What is creation? So there are people who are willing to stake uh, their identity on their belief about the origin of the universe, right? So there's the Adam and Eve story, and then there's Hinduism. And I just want you to step back the next time you <laughs> The next time you just feel like your whole life depends upon uh, the factual truth of the Adam and Eve story, when the person who wrote it would be completely insulted <laughs> because the person who wrote it said, of course, it's not a fact, it's a myth because I'm a wise person, I'm not a scribe. I don't write down facts, any dodo can do that. I talk about meanings and patterns and something that people will remember because it registers, right? So on the one hand, people, everybody's got that wrong. It's a myth and that's a compliment. But on the second, uh, the second point is a Hindu, not only a Hindu isn't gonna say that's false. They're just gonna say, well, that's your creation story and here's a few more. They don't care, right? <laughs> They absolutely don't care. You can envision creation this way. You can envision it that way. You can, you know, all it is is this emergence. So what we know is that the universe was simpler and it's more complex than it used to be. And it keeps getting more complex. But we do not worry about how it went, how, you know, what happened way back in the past. We, according to your particular path to God, according to you, the way your psyche works, you will picture it one way or you will picture it another way, whatever works for you. 
Um, so here's one, the golden em embryo, right? And that one to me is a little bit more female, like an embryo, you know, sort of emerging. Um, and then number two, B is the beginning was darkness. Um, and there was water. So you can compare this to, of course, the Adam and Eve story, which has this, the Adam and Eve story, again, the creation is, starts from simpler things that are simpler to things that are more complex. So there's this gradual evolution toward higher levels of complexity. Um, in the beginning, the one evolved, okay, and this is how the second create the second author envisions it. They think of it as poetry, right? It's not fact, it's poetry. It's just an image of how things came to be. Um, then there's the third person uh, wanted to focus on hunger and death as motivators. And of course, hunger and death, uh, pleasure and fear, right? Desire and um, uh, fear are big motivators for human beings. Um, and so this, this, this artist emphasized that as a foundation for what got the universe going, the energy that drives the universe. And then the fourth one is the one that I think every guy in the world would like. This is the guy one, this is not mine. Uh, it's the copulation theory, okay? <laughs> so, um, so there was a self, but hey, it happened to be a man, which there's no reason to think. I like the embryo. I like the female image better than the male, but okay, he was afraid. He longed for a second. Well, okay, that sounds kind of like Adam. Um so he was the size of a man and a woman in close embrace. So he split himself. He's the one who decided. He split himself. And from that arose husband and wife. And um, he copulated with her, right? And then something else was born. But she, um, how is it that he copulates with me even though he generated me from himself? and she runs away from him, okay? So she became a cow, he became a bull, he copulated with her and cattle were born. So, <laughs> so to me, this is a very gendered male view is that everything is a function of male um, ejaculations, right? And, <laughs> but you know, if it works for you, I guess, uh, the Hindus really don't care. So one of the uh, questions in your paper, I've had students write papers about, does it matter what sort of a creation story you have? Because for some students, that's just a really interesting idea. And they've written a lot of very um, inspired papers about it. So if that gets you going, go ahead. Um, so in the Hindu view, in the Hindu, the overall, the view is that everything is energy, okay? Everything is energy, but it, it uh, is constantly active, but it activates according to certain patterns, right? You can understand the types of energy, the way they interact. And so the Brahman is um, the source from which everything springs, right? So this is the creative source, Brahma. Um, and he has four heads, right? So he's looking in all directions. I, I like this image that it's like um, milk changes the curd water to ice and also steam. So the images in the Trinity for Christians is the same thing, can be liquid, solid, or gas, right? So God can be Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. Well, whether or not, you know, whatever, you might accept it, you might not. But this one is interesting to me is that it's a similar sort of image, right? It can be the same thing, but it can appear to be different. So, um, all right. And then the big, big factor in Hinduism 
is that what you are in your deepest self is your little piece of the Brahman, right? You have an Atman Brahman inside of you. It's covered with Maya flesh, but everything about Hinduism is getting you in touch with that inner bit of the universal energy. And so you want to be in harmony, right? You want to be in tune with the universe. And um, you try to escape Maya, right? The physical flesh, because that's um, illusion. That's not real. What's real is this little piece. And it's already been incarnated a number of times. And now it's incarnated in your particular body. And after you die, it will be incarnated into something else. So they want you to get this much broader perspective on the universe and your place in it is tiny, right? And, and you just try to stay in touch with that much, much bigger uh, creative force. All right, then Vishnu is preservation. I think this is interesting because um, the story of Christianity is that um, the universe, the culture was going downhill and everyone was looking for a Messiah, somebody to come and save, save the human race from its own destruction. And um, so God turned himself into a human being to show people how to live and to save people and to bring them back to where God wants them. Okay, well, there was a very similar kind of story in Persia, which is not very far from Israel, where this story, where Christianity began. So it's not the first time this kind of story was told. And so the Hindus also had the story that when things start deteriorating, uh, Vishnu will come to earth in various forms as an avatar. And I know that in the world of, I don't know, video games or whatever, avatars have been big in the past. I don't know if they still are, but they really were for a while. And I know that they, you know, whoever invented, whoever started this avatar thing knew all about Hinduism. Um, but um, so there's a whole, there's a whole list of forms that Vishnu came back. One time it was a wild boar. One time it was a, um, a tortoise. And um, okay, Matsaya was the first. Um, he was uh, the ancestor of the human race. Yeah, the tortoise supported the earth. Um, the others intervened to punish wrongdoers or to do right, right? It's always to sort of get things back, get the energy, get the bad karma out of the way and create some positive karma. Um, Krishna was the ninth one. And the story of Krishna coming to Arjuna is what the Bhagavad Gita is about. And I'll talk more about that later. But again, that's very much... Uh, the similarities and difference between Jesus coming, uh, God making God's self into a human being and teaching the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, that was, we can go back to that as Jesus' main mission statement. Um, and the notion that he was the Messiah, of course, that's very problematic. And did he know it? Blah, 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 blah. Um, but just the idea of having God come to earth in the flesh or in the form of a human being is not new. Um, and then the Hindus think that Buddha was, he started out as a Brahmin, uh, but some people thought that Buddha was another incarnation of Vishnu and other people thought not. So there's disagreements about that. Um, and when we read Buddha, then you'll understand why there's disagreement. And another thing that's important is that they do have a theory of the end times, right? And so in your lifetime, because of climate change and all these climate catastrophes, 
there are going to be a lot of people talking about the end times. And I think liberally educated people, people who unite reason and faith, have to, you know, they have to not let that uh, control the culture because then people will do nothing in the face of climate change. They'll just say, well, it must be the end times. And I, you know, if you unite reason and faith, then there's no way you think that we should just sit passively by and watch the creation be destroyed. Now you might think, you know, just in the name of science and humanism, of course you don't do that. And, but you can also say in the name of religion, God gave us minds, God gave us a universe we can understand and we're responsible for this. And we're going to suffer. We're going to get punished if we let it get destroyed. But that's where, if you remember those humanist manifestos, they're very much against fatalism, which would be this, you know, fate. it's fate. It's going to happen. So I just want to point out that among Hindus, there, there is that kind of end times. Um, okay. Shiva is okay the destructive so there's three forces there's creation preservation and destruction and um shiva is is destroyer but he destroys maya right he kills off maya illusion in order to revive the jiva to release the jiva back into the universe um nowadays nobody worships uh brahma but they do the two main sects are Vishnu or Shiva, at least I think so. Now, there's some students in the class here who um, come from Hindu countries, and I they can feel free to, to um, correct me. Okay, and so here are some of the documents if you want to read them. Um, yeah, okay, so I have the extended quotes. Now, let me uh, break back into the class. And uh, hands up, three people who want to react to this idea that there are multiple creation stories and because people are think differently and they get led to the jiva differently. And so it doesn't matter that much. Does anybody want to have a reaction to that, a comment? Alexis? Yeah, so even though I'm, you know, myself not religious, I kind of always, you know, had this idea that if there was some sort of creation or entity, that all of the sort of religions that we see throughout the entire world, it's kind of everybody's uh, idea of finding their purpose or, you know, what their own worldview. So that's kind of always been my perspective on everything, that all the creation stories leads to the same thing. Yeah, and if people use them to divide each other, that's a real corruption, right? Right, yeah. I mean, I, I also don't think that you don't have any, you know, God can appear, like even Christianity, God can appear in many different ways in many different forms. So why why is it such like a hard idea to believe that God is just appearing to somebody in like the Islamic way or the Hindu way or stuff like that? I don't understand why that concept is so hard to <laughs> comprehend. Right, good. Um, Destiny? I just think the um, inherent idea that multiple truths can exist at the same time is really interesting and powerful because truth is not necessarily um, a material thing, but an idea, which is not to say that truth should not be based on the material, but that um, there can be certain ideal philosophies that um, can exist in tandem, even if at first glance they seem paradoxical. Right. So how about this, Destiny? That what's actually out there, there's something out there, but our language keeps getting in the way of our ability to describe it because our language is based on physical immediate physical stuff. And so the, the words that we tend to use tend not that, you know, they, they don't refer to that. And so right. having different ways to explain it makes sense because you don't want to obsess on your words 
language is the only communication that we have between two experiences of self, but it's also extremely limited because it's grounded um, in individual experiences of self. And physical, in the, it's grounded in the physical world, right? And yeah. you're trying to explain- because there's no other way to ground it that everyone yeah. would understand. Right. Um, and, uh, can I say more? Sure. Um, so in terms of that idea I was explaining about the, um, the multiplicity of certain ideas that at first seem paradoxical, um, the one that comes to mind as an example is the paradox of tolerance. So there's this idea that in a tolerant society, one must tolerate all ideas, which at first is very simplistic, but then you realize that the paradox of tolerance is that you cannot tolerate intolerant ideas. <laughs> Those things are both true, but um, they are not uh, at first glance very compatible. Right. And not only that, but politics gets played. Yes. Um, there are people who come to liberal arts schools and deliberately say intolerant, divisive things just to test and then play on the tolerance, really... tolerance of others because they don't understand the paradox of tolerance or they never believed in tolerance as a concept to begin with. I think that's it. They want to destroy those institutions and that's the way to do it from exactly. within. Okay, yeah. Um, good, thanks, Destiny. Um, unta, Untari. <laughs> Yes, I'll get that. Um, so it's the idea of the end life um, that it the importance of to consider both faith and reason and, and reason and no and faith uh, both faith and reasons yes uh, because if not the pattern will be the same I think uh, and it's happened it's like when COVID nineteen occurs and a lot of people around me because I experienced it myself, uh, they reject to get vaccinated, uh, vaccinated because they thought it was God will and it just like a God punishment. And they just accept it that way without even trying to um, try to fight against this disease, Professor. That's fatalism, right? That's what yeah. a humanist, but a religion does not have to be fatalistic but it can be, that's, that's a problem. Um, so that's why I like, I like you to find out what you think about these questions. And also you have to know that you will be surrounded by people who have, you know, they've been told by their religious leaders or they have quotes in their holy books, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so, it's, it's an issue just to be prepared as you go into this world and have to lead it, which I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, thanks, Untari. That, that's important in a COVID world. Um, Kasturi? Yeah. Um, yes, Professor. So uh, I would like to comment on the destruction part related to Hinduism. So um, according to uh, Bhagavad Gita uh, and other religious books, uh, it's been told that um, the world is going to be destructed uh, um, after the end of Kali Yuga, which is the modern age that we are currently living in. So uh, it's quite weird when I uh, find the things that has been written in the book to be truth, you know. Uh, for instance, uh, whenever I meet uh, people of uh, around your age, they will tell us that uh, when we were child and adults, we didn't used to listen to, uh, we, we didn't used to hear any sort of uh, cases related to murders, rape, and uh, kidnappings and stops. Uh, but then uh, right now, uh, these cases are increasing a lot and people are just uh, dominating each other. They are just um, misbehaving, you know, like they are uh, some of the people, they are 
marrying uh, uh, people within the clan which is uh, not a, which is not considered um, moral in hinduism right so um, whenever they say it's such thing then i feel like uh, it is not just a myth but then it is true and i and i find it really interesting because like whatever it is written in the book it is uh, turning into truth and i don't know whether uh, uh, the things written in the book are just myth or uh, people have written it based on reality okay so that's why in this class because liberal education unites reason and faith there also are um, is hindu humanism so the humanist branch of hinduism would say we're supposed to use our minds right and we're supposed to create good karma and they would say um, that it's not that there are more rapes than there used to be. They're just being reported more, right? It's transparent. So, um, so no. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Professor. So, uh, it is. Uh, so uh, when I talk about these um, rape cases and other stuffs in context of Nepal, uh, I think it's true that uh, uh, the cases are increasing a lot these days. Uh, it is also true that um, we can see them increasing because they are reported now. But then in the past, people were not educated. They did not have access to internet and stuffs. And since they were not educated, they were uh, engaged in agricultural tasks a lot. And they didn't used to get time to be liberal most of the time, right? That's why they did not used to engage in such stuff. But then right now, uh, people are educated, they are, they are aware of each and everything, but then they are using their mind in a negative way. That's why the, uh, the things that we see right now are increasing a lot. Well, you know, each of you has to sort of make up your mind about um, how you want to right, how you want to deal with all this stuff. Um, so, but in general, the, the mission of a liberal arts school and the mission of AUW is that an education will empower you to create positive karma, basically, it, on a, <laughs> right? It's just to make the world a better place. And if you're Hindu, it would be positive karma. So that's the mission of AUW. And the foundation is humanism because that's what's common to all the students who come to AUW or to Lyon. Um, but, and, and the other thing I want women to realize is that a lot of people are gonna say, part of the reason we're going down is we let women out of the house, you know? <laughs> and, and they're gonna blame feminism. So be prepared if you wanna go that way. Um, because that'll a lot, I'm certain, I'm sure a lot of people will think so, but anyway, so, um, we have to go to the, um, lecture outline. Um, let's see. I, okay. All right. So, on um, this one, it's about cultural selection. Right, we start out with the basic human condition and then cultures select, they sort of head in one direction or another direction. So Confucius was a social genius and his focus was on relationships. And now Hinduism is the inner life. And so there's something like 150 words for the self, right? Because there's this constant introspection. So Hinduism really specializes in introspection, whereas Confucianism uh, specialized in interpersonal relations and the Western uh, specializes in science, right? Your relation to the, the um, natural world. So even in the Greeks, you had Demeter, Poseidon, you had the integration of nature and culture, Apollo, the god of, of medicine, and science. So, um, and, and that doesn't mean one is better than the other. As a matter of fact, the point of Mr. 
master um, of this quote is that they get out of balance, right? Uh, they keep selecting for one aspect of life and they keep ignoring these other things. And if you remember, Houston Smith said that the, the enlightenment of American enlightenment focused on science, but it was really not, it was really weak when it came to relationship issues. Now this one, this is why I like Houston Smith. He's so fair and he just tries to be very inclusive. He says that another thing that we need to balance out is the focus on um, uh, engagement. You are your CV, you are what you do, instead of um, this ability to step back and have a contemplative life. And so it's a correction for that. Um, all right, so the notion of conversion, I have a, I have a, whoops, a couple documents. To convert simply means to turn around. And so the idea of turning around from the world of appearance to an underlying deeper reality. So every religion has that, um, but Plato also has that, Plato's image of the cave, right? And so uh, we live in this cave of opinions where people care about pleasure, wealth, power, glory, all this stuff that's quantifiable, right? You, you, you get it, you, you know what, how, how much of an influencer you are, how many friends you have in your friend group, or, you know, Twitter posts, whatever. <laughs> that's the cave, guys. And then um, there's a turning around, right? So um, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, right? It looks one way, and the spiritual truth is the other way. So Plato has a humanistic version, right? The life of the mind, the noose, is a, is, um, a, I mean, you know, to call it intellectual, I just call it the mind, because it's not the modern view of reason. When it gets translated that, it's totally mistranslated. So Plato has a conversion experience story. Uh, Jesus has a conversion experience story. And Hindu has a turning around story, right? Um, let's see. So let me go back here to conversion experience, right? Turning around. Then the fact that a lot of Westerners... For Westerners, you have to have empirical data, you have a hypothesis, and you can prove it, right? Nothing is scientific knowledge unless you can actually prove it through physical data. And um, of course, Hinduism is all much more intuitive. It's about energy. It's about staying in touch with the jiva. But what's been discovered is that um, Westerners have found out that all those yoga positions, the, the chakras, the diet stuff, the meditation, all this stuff actually factually is really good for your brain. <laughs> and it really helps people function better. And so there's, there's this huge book by a doctor, Zen, and um, the art of Zen, and <clears throat> anyway, there's lots of books out by doctors, by empiricists, proving empirically that these techniques of Hinduism are really, really effective. Same with Buddhism. So uh, there's this other, we need this correction. Um, all right. So, so this was, this first page is a basic summary of what I'm going to go through or what Houston Smith does. What do you really want in life? And um, once you get, if you decide that's not good enough, pleasure, success, um, duty, then you turn around the conversion experience and there's four paths to God. And the reason I like this is that, and again, um, uh, let's see. Some of the other students have, have 
you know, express the same thing. Alexis, right. Um, that um, the, the, when I was eight years old, I told my little sister, I didn't think God was a person, right? I thought God was energy, right? So some people just think like that, right? From when they're little, they, they think of God as energy. But that in Hinduism, that's actually respected. <laughs> Whereas, you know, uh, I'm sure there's a number of students at Lyon that think that I don't believe in the city's gods, you know? Like I don't take the Bible as inerrant or literal or anything like that. But in Hinduism, you shouldn't, right? It's not a doctrinal religion. And then there's the path of love where you have to apologize for making God into a person, all right? I'm sorry, God, I know, I know you're not a person, but I have to personify you. So all of those Hindu gods, why are there so many? Because it's just like whatever floats your boat, you know, <laughs> whichever image, uh, the physical image sort of gets you in touch with the jiva, you know, go for it. But don't ever believe in these images because they're not, you know, they're not what you're trying to get at. Um, and then the path of work. These are people who say, don't, don't tell me what you believe in, all that. Just you prove it by doing it. Boots on the ground. You live your faith, right? If you volunteer, if you're according to what you're doing, that's how you show me. If you um, are, if it's a religious life, it's based on your actions. And then there's yoga, your ability, the yogi to meditate for long periods of time. So there's four paths to God and everyone should, their life includes part of that, but there's one path that's mainly the most comfortable for them. Then there's four stages in life and there's four stations in life. And Hinduism is an old religion. It's not the oldest. <laughs> Goddess worship is way, way older, but it's the oldest of the standard ones. And so it's got to account for everything. Okay, so the kind of churches that I've gone to in my life are more like social clubs. They're not big. Um, the Quaker meeting I went to this morning, Unitarianism I went to last week, and then Methodism. Those are more like um, social clubs. You know, people uh, sort of gravitate toward the kind of person that they are. But, but I don't, I, I'm not going to join the Quaker meeting or the Unitarians, even though I am more of that kind of person. But I, I think I need to be around uh a place where there's more difference, you know, where, where you have to reach out and you have to listen a little bit more. But Hinduism is really incredible that way because it's so multifaceted and it's incorporated the arts and it's incorporated eating and breathing. And, you know, every aspect of life has been studied and practiced for so long, and then the stages and the stations. So, um, so here is the little chart about what is it you really want in life? Everybody really wants infinite joy, infinite knowledge, infinite being. And then Hinduism says, well, you already have it. It's right inside of you. <laughs> you just have to get in touch with it. And so, um, so there's the four goals in life. And then if you decide that's uh, there's must be something more than this, then there's the different paths to God. Um, and then every person is either primarily reflective, God is impersonal or primarily um, emotional, God is personal. But each person also has to include some meditation in their life and some action in their life. Um, all right, so the purpose of myths in all of the ones we study is the union of the primitive side of the brain it has to get integrated into culture in some way. So we've been through the Greek stuff, we've been through Confucius, 
Um, and now we're doing Hindu. Um, so let's see, I will ask a couple of these questions and then I'm gonna break and ask you to raise your hand, right? And have some reactions. How many of you have had what you would call a conversion experience? Um, it means to turn around. How did you interpret it? How did it change your life? Um, okay, and what do you think the word soul means, of course? Um, let's see. And then there's the Western science um, and psychology versus Eastern mysticism. And um, even the West has this tradition, a contemplative tradition, the Benedictine tradition, um, and other monasteries, monastic traditions. So I go and live with Benedictine nuns because I am a contemplative, even though I go to the Methodist church, a very activist kind of church. They can use me. <laughs> they got to step back uh, sometimes. So I try to balance out all those things. What is stress? This is something you might want to talk about. So the rest of you who haven't raised their hands, I think you would be able to contribute about this. So what's my point? Remember when we talked about stress before and we talked about it as a immune, you know, there's a physiology to it. So we talked about Esther Sternberg and she had studied, she was on the science oriented side and then her mother kept telling her why, why can't you bring in religion? Then she had this breakdown, then she went to Greece and she hobnobbed with the goddesses for a while and got better. So, um, so we're gonna revisit that notion of stress. Is it a social problem? Is it natural or cultural, right? How is it that cultures either make, make it worse, right? Stress is natural in the sense that human experience is vulnerable. We are vulnerable in a zillion ways. And that's why we have aggression, right? We, we worry about survival. Animals worry about survival. Humans worry about survival. And so they have triggers, right? They, and the trouble is that cell phones are designed to trigger our fear reaction primitive, right? Primitive level, they're designed to do that. So we get hooked to them, hooked on them. Um, but anyway, so are there ways, a lot of ways where the societies you grew up in um, aggravate stress, right? So what are some of the things? Do you experience stress about doing well in school, right? How good is good enough? Do you focus on what you learned or, or on your grade, right? If you focus on what you learn, you don't have to stress out. You just learn, right? And I don't, I don't pit students against each other. I don't say only 10% get A's, right? Because I don't, I don't believe in that. Um, so, but what you learn is something you can control, right? The grade. You, you know, there should be a connection between the grade and what you learn. But as long as all you care about is the grade, it's going to stress you out because that's not entirely under your control. Um, and so you have to think about that in your relationships with family and friends. Are you concerned about your public image or about the quality of the relationship? You can control to some extent the relationship, but you can't control your public image. You can't control what other people say about you. Socrates said that. Remember when Crito was saying, <laughs> it would make me look bad. You got to get out of here. Um, so you have to think about that, right? Um, how is it that does, if our society focuses on personal achievement, then to some extent, you have given your identity over to somebody else's power, right? Because they're the ones that have the power to grade you or, you know, let you into a, a program or not let you in or this and that, right? So if, if you completely get your identity caught up in your CV, 
then you're going to stress out. If you just keep asking yourself, what do I want? What do I want? And then, you know, meditate, keep that inner self alive, you'd be a lot less stressed. Um, and that's what Hinduism is getting at. Do you feel pressure to be the perfect whatever? Um, okay, so, so that's one question. So let, let's go through three things and then I'll stop. But the one question is stress. And again, we don't need to go back over what we talked about before, but can you understand that Hinduism is addressing that? You know, all the meditation practices, all the um, getting in touch with the jiva, that whole view of reality is really trying to get people to be able to function better. Um, what do you really want in life? Here's question two. And, and any, I mean, I should be able to call on anybody and they can answer this question. So which path do you think you're on right now? Are you on the path of pleasure? Probably not, since you wouldn't have managed to have enough self-control to get high enough grades to get into these colleges, <laughs> right? Um, so if you, you know, are on the path of pleasure, you're pretty self-indulgent. Um, but let me tell you about um, what a Hindu would say about somebody can be uh, physically, biologically older, but psychologically younger, right? Somebody, so what about, okay, we used to have a guy teaching at Lyon long ago, you don't know his name, whatever, okay. So when he's in his midlife, 40s or whatever, he buys himself this bright red, a uh, convertible sports car with the condom on the front, right? The little black plastic, whatever. And he drives it around, right? So he's going to be virile. He's going to like, ah, feel his oats. <laughs> uh, so what, or somebody dumps his wife for a younger woman because he wants to feel like a teenager again. You know, he wants to have some good hot sex. So he throws his family away. All right, what would a Hindu say? Now, this is technically speaking, if you're a really good Hindu, and I've had students that are Hindu, and that's not what they learned, but, but just think about it. What they would say is that's a young soul. They haven't been through enough reincarnations, right? They're still a young soul. So you don't judge people at all. You just say they're... Jiva, you know, they're going through various cycles. So I'm not, you know, it's not my problem. It's not my business. My business is to stay in touch with the Jiva, right? Um, so the path of pleasure, the path of success. So you'll find these businessmen who are obsessively competing and they're, they have to win and they've got to be the richest and they got to get higher on the the Forbes Fortune 500 or whatever, their whole goal in life is to go from number eight to number seven or whatever. Um, and then, so some people, you know, they, they are that way till their death. And you don't judge them. You say, okay, it's a younger soul. That's where they're at. They'll go through some more incarnations. Just let it be, let it be. Um, and then the third one is you, you sort of get tired. This is Bill Gates, right? He was extremely competitive. I used to read about him because he's like six months different than, than I am. And he used to be the stingiest man in human history because he had a lot of money and he was still obsessing about somebody's gonna, you know, gonna beat me out. And finally, his, his dad, said on uh, you know starts talking to public radio and all this tv shows and saying we try to tell bill you know to lay up but then he got married then he had a kid and he kind of there was this interview where he said you know the human mind is really complex 
And it sort of occurred to him why not everybody wants to be at work with four computers in front of them all day. <laughs> and he, there's other things in life, actually. So he basically switched, right? He switched from this to the next one, the path of duty, right? Becoming a philanthropist. Um, so that's where he is now, right? Big, big time. And his wife, Melinda, I read her book, very interesting book. Um, so he now he's on the path of duty. But the trouble is, you can give, you know, you can help nonprofits and they keep falling apart. Or you can keep trying to help people and they don't want to be helped. And it gets frustrating after a while. And so if you get to the point where even the path of duty just seems like you're on this endless, uh, it just doesn't seem to be getting uh, where I want to go. And uh, with climate change, I would not advise anybody to give up on that. But, okay, so you can get to this point where you say, is that all there is? That's when Hinduism comes in, right? You're looking for something else. That's a spiritual crisis. So in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Arjuna, his duty is to kill his cousins because his cousins have really offended the karma. They've created all this terrible karma. So his religious duty to bring back positive karma is to, to go to war with his own cousins. And he doesn't want to do it. You know, he just says, I can't do this. I can't do this. And then Krishna comes and says, look, it's a religious duty. You do it, but you don't take any ego pleasure. You do it at, at a distance, right? You stay in touch with the jiva. All you're doing is trying to bring humanity back to something positive. Don't get your ego caught up in it. Don't, you know, you're just, it's a religious um, duty. It's, it's your, your, um, your particular lot in life at this point. The goal is always positive karma. That's the goal. Um, all right. So then he turns around, right? And um, he sees, actually, Arjuna has this vision of the Atman Brahman, of infinite knowledge, infinite joy, infinite. That's in, like, chapter 9. And, um, okay, so then the quote is that all of the exercises are devoted to that goal, to get in touch with, with your inner innermost self. Um, and then... Again, Houston Smith is always saying, this is realistic. This is empiricist. This is not some freaky, weird, mystical thing. It's realistic, matter of fact, practically minded, how to stay in touch with the Brahman. Um, and then there's this description, the path to knowledge, the path of love, is that you have to envision God as a person, but you apologize for it. Um, Forgive me, it's due to my limitation. You are everywhere, but I worship you here. You are without form, I worship you in this. So, um, and there, okay, somebody needs, okay, Giovanni. Okay. Um, so there are many incarnations. So a Hindu would say that Jesus is an incarnation of the, of Vishnu or that Krishna, that Buddha, and then Hindus disagree on whether Buddha was. But the idea is that Vishnu, the preserver, will come back to earth to try and um, get people back on board. Then there's the path of duty. Do the task caring nothing. Don't get emotionally caught up. Don't worry about the fruit of the action. Just do the action. And then the psycho, the uh, meditation and all of that. Okay, so I'm going to, there's three points that you could talk about, well, any, you talk about anything I've talked about, but talk about conversion experience, talk about stress. You can talk about the four paths to the infinite. If one of those is more comfortable to you, 
the four paths in life. If right now you are on the path of success, which a lot of students at college are, um, and then the, yeah, the stress. So you can comment on any of those things. Now, is there anybody who didn't talk last time who would like to raise their hand? Because I'm gonna try, I'm gonna start trying to make sure everybody. Okay, Rossi, go ahead. Um, I wanna talk about stress. So I feel like for stress, sometimes it's all up in our head. We might be tired from something and then we feel like um, it's overwhelming for us. Like I, I can feel that um, this weekend I have a lot of work to complete. And so I feel like it's, it's stressful and I feel like I can't complete anything or get anything done where I have been working like the whole day, like since five in the morning to like 1 a.m. the next, like the next day without like nonstop. And I still feel like I'm unproductive. So sometimes if we take a break and pause, like that thought that we constantly have in our mind that, oh, this is too much or like, I'm not gonna get this done. And that stress level will like go down. Or if we just have a talk or just, I feel like diverge our attention from what we're currently working on, then that's like a good start. Actually, I, I usually require students, again, I'm not gonna do it because of all the readings. If you try this, if you don't normally do it, to meditate for half an hour and, and just try to think of nothing and just breathe slowly and sit very still. And then you have to write about the experience. And a lot of my Lion students are totally amazed at how much difference it makes. And it's just very sad that that hasn't been incorporated into their life at some point. Because in the West, we really are crazy busy and going on your phone and being motivated by fear and the Facebook thing. It really is destroying your brains. It really is. Like there's all sorts of uh, brain scans saying, you got to stop doing this. So that idea that the white matter in the back of your head is not developing or it's deteriorating <laughs> and the stuff in the front of your brain is, is deteriorating because it's overstimulated you really do need to learn some sort of meditative or reflective practice uh, physiologically. Does that make sense, Rossi? And again, yeah, yeah you, Rossi is in a Buddhist family in a Buddhist country. So it's, I mean, just the way culture is, they sort of understand that to some extent where America really is going way to an extreme. Um, Giovanni, what about you? Um, I was kind of thinking about the the stress thing as well. And I think, honestly, stress is like a natural thing. And it occurs with like any human that's like trying in life, you know, like anybody that's like trying to do better or aiming for something and is working towards it. Like that naturally builds stress within you because you start thinking about like if I can fail or or if I don't make it or if my standards are too low or whatever. And I feel like it's very like, it's harsh to judge stress because it's like everybody in life has like different stress. Whereas I can be stressed about passing a class in college, but there's also people stressed about not even being able to get into college. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. So there's, like, there's levels for it. And it's like, it's really opinionated because one person can, can, think what you're dealing with they would never even consider it stress but it's just that the life you're living and your experiences is, is different so to you it, it may seem stressful but I feel like what we have to do as like humans is just understand that like to help deal with the stress I would say I guess it's to understand that like there's people living all, always worse off than you you know so like whatever you think that's bothering you or might be fighting or against you in in, in your time of trying like you always have to remember that like there's somebody 10 times off worse than you so right. yeah that's that's basically it right if you think of hinduism six thousand years old people had a lot of problems right they had health problems they i mean no they had a lot and they still do um and they managed to develop this system um 
And I do, I do want to give you a quote. It reminds me of that. But just in my own case, my father grew up uh, in a dysfunctional household. And then he went in the depression. He was really poor. They didn't even have water. He had to dig a well. Um, and then he went through the war. And so when he got home, nothing bothered him. Right? <laughs> like, he was never stressed because America then became more and more affluent. Well, then his children, you know, we have, you know, we can't, we have a totally different orientation. And I think he probably got kind of frustrated sometimes with what we took as important. <laughs> because, like, but he didn't talk about it. He never talked about the depression because it wasn't, he didn't want his kids to be exposed to that. The trouble is you don't get any perspective. So there's that. Yeah, and, I understand what you mean. Yeah. And then there's um, just people oftentimes, yeah, I do think all of you do need to keep asking, well, what do I really want? I've asked myself many times, right? What do you really want? And then you just, you know, stay focused. And then you make sure to, to say, well, I tried, right? Like, you can't say, I want to get straight A's. You could say, I'm going to try my best at these different subjects. And if you don't do well in one, that's not the thing you should do for your career. Like, that's how you find out <laughs> who you are, is that how difficult something is for you or how pleasant or unpleasant it is for you, right? You're basically figuring out your place. But if you insist, right, on beating everybody else out on every test or something, um, that's, it's Maya, it's illusion, it doesn't matter. And it will definitely cost you a lot of stress. Um, okay, oh yeah, I did want to point out one thing about, um, this is an amazing quote that a student from uh, AUW gave me, and I don't have the, the reference, but I sure would like it if somebody can find it. Um, it's really about colonialism. It's so extreme. Um, this is Lord Macaulay. Um, and he, she, he, she talks about the effects of colonialism on Bangladesh at the moment. You know, it still has um, a profound effect. Lord Macaulay, he says, I've traveled across the length and breadth of India. I haven't seen one person who's a beggar, a thief, such wealth I've seen in this country, such high moral values, people of such caliber. I don't think we would ever be able to conquer this country unless we break the very backbone of the nation, which is her spiritual and cultural heritage. Isn't that awful? <laughs> But I mean, okay, as a philosopher, this is what I say, ideas matter, right? It's their ideas that have led to their behavior of being, you know, uh, a harmonized, a, a good society, high quality of life, considering that the people don't have a lot. And therefore, in colonialism, you have to replace her old and ancient education system, her culture, for if they think that all that's foreign and English is good and greater than their own, they'll lose their self-esteem, their native culture, they'll become what we want them to be, a truly dominated nation. Oh, that is evil. <laughs> but anyway, and then she talks about how that's had such an impact in Bangladesh and it's had an impact all the colonized nations. But um, that's, you know, the point I'm making is that culture, your, your worldviews, as you work out your worldviews, they matter, right? And I, I, I am also saying that, that the U.S. needs to have an infusion of humanism or we're going to lose our democracy um, because we've got to be able to get along with each other and be committed to citizenship. But on the other hand, in the name of being advanced and, and science and democracy, we destroyed really, you know, 
well-functioning cultures. Now, it wasn't perfectly functioning, right? The caste system, there's a lot of stuff. But this is so cynical and so wicked, but it's still true, right? You still have this problem where the best and the brightest in colonized countries go to the West to get educated. And some of them come back and they just want their countries to become more and more Western. And some of them at this point are saying no. And so there's really a lot of interesting dialogue going on about what should we keep from our ancient culture and what should we uh, adapt. And then there's, of course, the economic system that's destroying all of us in some ways. But it's creating wealth, but it's also creating a lot of materialism and a lot of problems. Um, anyway, so let's go back here and go. Oh, yeah, we were at the. OK, I wanted a couple more people raise their hand who haven't spoken yet. You must have something to say. Oh, Aiden. OK, go ahead. Um, so going off of, uh, since we talked about like how when people go to like war and they come back, um, stuff just doesn't stress them out as much. So I read um, that one of the reasons that veterans have trouble coming back to normal life after they go to war is because it doesn't stress them out so much. Um, so like because when they're in war, every like second matters because they're always fighting for their life. So then when they come back and they're not fighting for their life, um, it's, I guess it's harder for them to care about stuff and just like function, function um, and be happy because like they see everybody else and they're, everyone else is stressed out about little things and all they can think about is how um, like, you know, a month ago or a year ago, they were about to die all the time um so yeah i was just thinking it's not always a good thing to not be stressed because stress is like a necessary emotion and then it helps you like have ups i guess because stress you know it brings your emotions down but if your emotions are down once in a while they can be up and you know you can be happy but if you're always just in the middle you're never happy yeah, okay. So what is PTSD, right? There's probably different reasons why veterans have trouble re-engaging, right? Some of them might have really have trigger reactions because they've been in fearful situations so much, but other ones just can't get bothered by what bothers people because it seems so trivial. Does that make sense? Um, and then I've had some veterans. I haven't had a lot of them, unfortunately, but they always have a perspective. So one semester in the same class, I had two of them that wanted, they both wanted to become doctors because they wanted to do something positive, right? <laughs> They'd been in the situation where people are harming each other physically and they wanna be a doctor and heal people, right? So usually coming back from war does completely change your orientation, uh, especially in a, in a world like ours, that if it's consumer oriented, they really want you to, to be focused on trivial things so that you'll buy stuff, right? Um, yeah, that's true. Anybody else want to uh, make a comment? Okay, so uh, Samantha, go ahead. Yes. One of one of the very interesting things I found in the reading was specifically about the path of success. And it was the specific quote of a failure, a failure to go beyond the individual's desire and goals is a kind of arrested development. And I found that very interesting in the fact that if you don't go beyond your own desires, you're kind of putting yourself, you're harming yourself in the same way. And I just found that really fascinating, that thought process. Okay, good. Um, yeah, does it really make you happy to be obsessed about your own success all the time? <laughs> um, yeah, you should think about it. 
Um, and, and Houston Smith says things like, we really aren't wired. We're really wired to look at the bigger picture. And that's what makes us happy. And um, we're what? We're born to think in more eternal ways, long lasting ways. Good. Okay, so let me go back to the, but if you haven't spoken yet, I'm going to call on you, so be prepared. Um, okay, the next thing was um, path of duty. So uh, you could think about when you get into groups, you can also think about did you think about God as a kid? Did you think about God as energy? Or does it make sense to you to think? Or, I mean, really think, what kind of person are you? Are you a person who really focuses on energy and, and sort of needs time to uh, re-engage with the universe, right? I... <laughs> I'm weird that way, right? I got to get out and go walking in the morning, get my body going, but just get in touch with the universe, basically. Um, but most people, they, they, their path to God or their, their path to humanism, it doesn't have to be any sort of divinity, right? Their way of becoming a humanist definitely has to do with relationships, right? relationships and constantly weaving people together or the friendships you have really make or break your life. And a lot of people are like that. Um, then the other type are doing, right? Don't talk to me about, just show me that you're a good person by what you do, right? So it might be somebody who starts an organization. It might be somebody who, um, just gets people to do this or gets people to do that because doing is the way that you prove that you're making the world a better place, right? So activists, uh, like during the, during the Vietnam War, it was always uh, not to decide is to decide, right? If you don't demonstrate, then nothing is gonna change. So you've gotta get out there, get your boots on the ground and, and get your butt out there. Well, the thing about me is when I was out there, I would go out there, but people were in it for the wrong reason, right? Some people were demonstrating for the wrong reasons. And I thought, just narcissism, I don't want to get hurt, or just rebellion, or whatever. And I thought, it's not going to last, right? If, you, if you're doing it for the wrong reason, it will go down in history as some kind of narcissism instead of questioning Western imperialism, right? So it does matter why you're there. It also matters that you're nonviolent rather than violent. But um, so that's how I ended up being more of a contemplative because it isn't just what you do. But for a lot of people, it is just what you do. So those are people on the path of action. So you have to think, which one am I, right? Reflection, uh, relationships, love, action, or um, meditation. Um, so the, the thought there is that I don't know how many of you um, would do this, but I think in America, it would be crazy. What if on Monday morning, somebody asks you, did you have a good weekend? And you said, yes, I sat and stared into space for two days straight. It was wonderful. <laughs> I, uh, you know, most Americans, they wouldn't do it. But if they did, it was, you're lazy, you're being lazy. Like, no, that's, that's really bad. Uh, but, you know, in Hinduism, that's, you're a yogi, right? That's your orientation. Um, so I want you to, when you're in your little, in your small groups, please talk about that. Then there's the four stages of life. Um, so when you- No! <laughs> Samantha. Samantha. He has to be in class. Samantha. Mute. <laughs> that wasn't me, Professor. Oh, it's not? Okay. All right. Um, okay. 
four stages of life. So you can think about, and I don't know if you talk to your parents or your grandparents. I, I didn't, so I don't know. But um, do they talk about different stages in life, right? You're just preoccupied with different things. And that's perfectly fine, right? You can't, you don't want to be focused on the same things your whole life. So um, when my kids were pre-first grade, my brain was like in a different spot because it was just obsessed about this little kid. And then when my daughter and my daughter-in-law had little kids, I noticed that, right? They're in that space. They're in this, it's pretty primitive, really. And it doesn't show like you wouldn't know it. Uh, you'd have to sort of be there to, to be able to recognize it. Um, but there's a part of you that just never, ever stops thinking about that little baby because they're so vulnerable. So then there's the household phase where you have different orientation. Then there's um, stepping back. And so um, this is another thing where the religion makes a huge difference and you don't even know it or the culture. If you're a humanist, um, you want to maximize, right? You want to be exercising all of your natural abilities for as long as you can, right? So when you retire, you find ways to use your talents to co keep contributing. You just don't get paid. That's, that's my plan, right? And so, um, but that's not in Hindu. In Hindu, you start um, pondering, right? You start reflecting. And then at the end, um, it has this image that your old teacher comes to the back door begging because the teacher now has nothing and they are begging for rice, right, to eat something. Now, in a Hindu, that would be a hugely successful life because you have managed to detach yourself and you're ready for release, right? You're liberated. Whereas in the United States, I think if I came to your back door begging, <laughs> I don't think you'd think, boy, Dr. Beck's really successful in her old age. <laughs> but that's, that's the power of religion. Um, and people will often say, you know, really all people care about is, right, eating, drinking, money, power, whatever. But you can, you can create a culture where people are really focused differently. And then uh -huh. for stations in life. Listen, if I catch any of y'all. Okay, uh, whose microphone is on? No. Okay, Who, whose microphone? Okay. The stations in life, this is the caste system. And so Hinduism, of course, gets really in trouble for the caste. And that's what Macaulay did not refer to. So that's important. And there's still, caste plays a huge role in, in India. Um, but what Houston Smith does, and he always does this, he always is fair. He says, what's the original idea? And he gives everything as positive a spin as he can. And so the original idea is that people are spiritually different. And so some people are the seers, right? The artists, the intellectuals, the ones who um, understand like these patterns and they can guide, right? The culture guide people and they become the professor, the teachers, they become the artists, maybe the preachers or the religious leaders. And they don't need money, but they need leisure time to think, right? Then there's the administrators, the people who run everything, and they don't have time, but they are, they, they're given the most responsibility, so they're given power and money, but they also are punished the most because they're trusted, right? So you really need the people who you get in trust with power and money and, and responsibility are also the people you should punish the most if they abuse it. Then there's the producers who have less responsibility, and then there's the laborers. And so what he said was, even with all that poverty and all that uh, population, they never resorted to slavery. They just have to figure out 
the least talented, and then there's social demands for pretty low level manual labor. So um, my own view is that Bill Gates couldn't run Microsoft unless somebody was there to build the buildings, somebody is there to clean the floor, somebody's there to clean the toilets. Um, so I, I think there should be an income dis difference, but it shouldn't be 350 times, which it is right now. There's a, the CEO makes 300 times more than the person at the bottom, the receptionist or whatever. And so that's where I think people are different in their abilities. They're also different in what they're interested in. There's just the doer type people. There was somebody on the grounds crew at Lion and he said, I used to be an engineer. I worked in an office. I hate it. I hate it. I just want to come out here and, you know, uh, do the blow, blow leaves and shovel snow or, you know, just take care of the grounds crew. That's where I'm happy. And I do, I think it's fine. I just don't think the income disparity should be that great because I think we ought to, we do depend on each other and we do need each other. And that's not socialism or Marxism. That's just the truth. Um, but what happens, the problem is that kids are born with their own spiritual calling and their own interests and passions. But if their parents are powerful, you know, what would a parent who's um, uh, the president of some company, what if somebody tells them, you know, your son really is a natural ditch digger. I mean, he really, that's, he's going to be comfortable as a ground crew person. Well, they don't want to say that, you know, they don't ever want their kids to go down in, in the ladder. And that's why it gets corrupted is that people uh, uh, pass on to their children their same levels of status and money or more they just won't allow these natural orientations to um, emerge and that's the same with the greek all the greek deities represent different passions and parents don't want them to do that and then jesus is Parents were mad when they caught him in the in the uh, church um, talking to the to the rabbis. So um, so on the one hand, people are different, and that's fine. On the other hand, what does society do about it? You know, and do parents allow their children to be whatever they really feel comfortable being? Um, all right, so I do want to break you in groups about that. Again, comments about anything we've done before, stress, your, your goals in life, your path to God. If you have comments about stages in life and you have comments about stations in life. Um, so another thing was um, when my kids were growing up, there, I mean, who's going to be the coach, the, you know, the father, the dad coach of all their teams, and then the Girl Scout leader and the Boy Scout leader. And I really admired all those people. I'm just really no good at that stuff. And I, I it's just such a duty for me because I just am not good at <laughs> thinking about, oh, well, you can imagine, you know, should what sort of little crafty activity should I have today? And oh, God, it's painful. <laughs> but I did appreciate it a lot. And I appreciated that these people really just wanted 40 hour a week jobs. And then they wanted to go coach their son's team. And they, they deserve to have a living wage. And they deserve to have, you know, health care and decent public education and all that stuff. And that's reality. That's not socialism or anything. Um, all right. So I'm going to put you in groups for the last uh, 10 minutes. And then if you have questions, um, you can come back.